It's time for our next big adventure. We are driving the Pacific Coast Highway, starting in Malibu and making our way north. So join us as we explore the beautiful coastline of California on this epic road trip. The sights and sounds of our Pacific Coast Highway adventure are being uploaded using Nomad Internet. If you need your own internet, be sure to check our link in the description below. Hey, hey, welcome to Bodega Bay. No, just no. <laughs> so we are in Bodega Bay. We've made our way a little further north and we have heard that this place has absolutely amazing oysters. There are supposed to be tons of oyster farms in both the Bodega Bay and the Tamales Bay. And so we absolutely could not help ourselves. We need to have some more seafood because we're like on a seafood kick. We're on a seafood diet. Yeah, Get it? it's seafood, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go find some amazing oysters to try here. Okay, I think I'm stuffed to the gills. That's a seafood joke. That is a seafood joke. We ended up going to a little place called Fisherman's Cove. It was one of the highest rated places for oysters, which what we were looking for, and that's what this is, place is famous for. We gave it a shot. We had the clam chowder. It was actually really, really good, really creamy. There was a little bit of smokiness in it. I think it was from bacon. Yeah, I think there was a little bit of bacon in it. And then we had some of the garlic bread with it, which was really good. Just kind of give you that little extra touch with the chowder. Fantastic. Also had the halibut and chips. So I haven't had any fried halibut in quite some time, so I was really excited to see that they had it as one of their daily specials and it was really good. Hallie's butt was tasty. I don't know why he's tasting Hallie's butt but this isn't making the video. Is. Why not? <laughs> and then of course were the barbecued oysters we got. We got <clears throat> the oysters that were grilled in garlic butter and had a dash of cocktail sauce with wasabi in it. The oysters were nice, briny, and plump, and juicy, which I really appreciate because sometimes when you get barbecued oysters, they grill the crap out of them, and they're they're kind of dry and tough and chewy, so, I mean, it's, it's perfect. They were really tasty. Yum. We're not in the North Pole. It's just really chilly and windy out here today. We left Bodega Bay, headed up the coast, and ended up in Point Arena. Arena. I think it's Arena. A-R-E-N-A. -E However you want to pronounce it. The Spanish version or the English version. <laughs> like, I always or, use the wrong one. As we've gone further north, the coast keeps on getting rockier and rougher. So that means the frequency of lighthouses has actually increased. There is another lighthouse here at Point Arena. <laughs> I can't stop laughing about it. So this lighthouse here was actually built in 1870 as well. The last one we stopped at was built in 1870. The original one was actually destroyed by an earthquake in 1906. Part of the San Andreas Fault kind of runs right past this area. It was basically destroyed and they had to tear the whole thing down and they rebuilt a new one. One of the really cool features about this lighthouse is you can actually stay here. They have vacation rentals here that you can purchase and they even have their own lighthouse cat. Yes, they have a little kitty that lives here on the lighthouse grounds. Her name is Mina. Arena Mina. I think it's Arena because it's Arena Mina. I think it might be. <laughs> we haven't the cat seen... solved the mystery. We haven't we haven't seen her out and about today. We're looking but for. We're still looking. Hopefully we can find her and say hi. But if not, then it's pretty windy out here. Hopefully she's someplace warm and getting cuddles. Yeah, so they have a little museum here where you can learn a little bit more about the lighthouse if you want to do that. And then they have actually a really, really cute little gift shop here. But now... It's time to move on. Let's go. I don't know why she keeps rushing me. Unfortunately, the lighthouse staircase is closed. Don't know when that happened or when it's going to reopen. So if you do want to go up into the lighthouse, yeah, it's just... Yeah, been closed since COVID kind of happened, so... It never reopened. Yeah. Apparently, they're supposed to be open at some time in the future. So if you want to go up in the lighthouse, just keep your eyes on their website. another beautiful morning along the Pacific Coast Highway and today we are in Fort Bragg, California. So we're actually coming to the end of our portion on Highway 1. There's just I think maybe about 30 miles left past Fort Bragg. So we're really kind of wrapping up this Pacific Coast 
trip through California here. We are starting our day off here at Noyo Headlands. It's a beautiful little park. It has hiking trails all along the beach here. You can see the formations out here are absolutely incredible. Kind of steep and rocky. I'm not sure on how you get down to the beach, but we're gonna find a way. So one of the big attractions here at Noyo Headlands and Fort Bragg is a place called Glass Beach. So Glass Beach is a beautiful thing that kind of came out of really an environmental disaster. Up until like the 50s or some people even say the 70s, I'm not, not sure when they stopped it. They used to dump trash into the ocean here. It used to be the, the city's landfill and they would back trucks up, dump their trash into the ocean, which also included tons of glass bottles. So over the years, the ocean did its thing. It reclaimed that trash and it turned these bottles into beautiful pieces of glass kind of like this little guy, which is what we're going to go looking for. We've successfully made it down to the beach and it's so cool to see all the sea glass here. But on the other hand, you also have to think that they dumped everything here. So it's not just glass, you know, they dumped, you know, tires and old metal parts and cans and, but the glass parts of the beach are really cool. Supposedly in the 1980s, that was what the entire beach looked like until a ton of people came, thought it was pretty, and they started collecting the sea glass and pretty much depleted the beach of its sea glass. But there's still plenty down here to kind of give you a general idea. And it looks really, really cool. Keep in mind, it is illegal to keep sea glass on this beach. So if you find it, you gotta leave it. So we managed to collect quite a bit. We even found some blues, although they're really, really hard to find down here. And the greens aren't so popular, but you can find lots of white and brown pieces. I think some of my favorite are these little, almost like orangish colored ones that are kind of like, you don't see a lot of those. They're kind of fun. As Jed already told you, it is illegal to keep these. So we have to return them to the beach. So ready? Yep. So the sea glass beach is actually really, really cool. You have to kind of go down onto the beach to really be able to see the pieces of glass. And even though there's not as much as there used to be, it's still worth going and seeing while you're here in Fort Bragg. But now we are going to head over to the sea glass museum so we can learn a little bit about how these different colored glass sea glasses and other little things that you found in the area are made or what they're made from. So we just finished up at the Sea Glass Museum. It's, it's a pretty small museum, so there's not like a lot of room to talk in there and things like that. But it's actually, I think, worth going to and seeing just to learn about the sea glass. Yeah, it's really cool. They have displays set up so you can see all the kinds of sea glass. It tells you how the sea glass is formed. So apparently there's no glass offshore. They say that everything's dumped there, stays at the beach. It just acts as a rock tumbler and it smooths it out to its nice gem-like quality that it is today. Yeah, and why it's so effective, especially like in these northern parts of the Pacific Coast, is because the coast is really rocky and those glass pieces can kind of hit against the rock and tumble and stuff like that. So sea glass comes in all different colors from white, yellows, oranges, purples, pinks, reds, cobalt blue, like all kinds of colors, beautiful colors. And there's even glass that glows in the dark. So back in the day, they used to put uranium, low levels of uranium, inside of the glass to help with the shine and the luster. And under black light, they actually glow like crazy. The radiation's not enough to harm a human being. I mean, I wouldn't eat it, but I mean, just looking at it, you're fine. But it's also interesting to learn where the different glasses come from. So a lot of the reds that you see were from old taillights of cars. The oranges are from blinkers, the orange blinker covers. You get a lot of the blues. So some of the, the really dark blues are from like Noxema, and milk of magnesia and all those guys used to make their bottles from glass instead of plastic so those were all broken down into like those colors of course like the purples and the blues are, are pretty rare the whites and the browns tend to be very common because they're very common colors for bottles and there's some from just regular you know dishes and glassware that people had in their homes mm -hmm. that were eventually discarded because you know they didn't want it anymore or was chipped or broken so they threw it in the trash and then they also had some pieces that were almost like they're like fusion pieces because like a lots of landfills like they didn't just dump the dirt or the garbage over they burned it the rock would like mold i guess mold or cement somehow with those pieces of glass so you get these like mixed pieces too i think it's it doesn't take more than 15 20 minutes to really go through this museum but i think it's cool to kind of learn about where they all came from 
Another fun fact about sea glass is that it makes me really hungry, so we're gonna try and grab some lunch. Okay, so we just ate and beat feet back to the van because it is pouring rain. It is. And it's cold. But the place we ate at it was absolutely incredible. Yeah, so we actually let Google and Yelp decide where we were going today. We did a search for the best restaurant in all of Fort Bragg, and what it came up with was a little restaurant called My Infusion. We figured you guys were probably getting tired of oysters, fish and chips, and whatever else we've yeah, been eating. Yeah, all the seafood, and we needed a little bit of a change, and we're so glad we went there because, for one, the food was amazing. Yeah, it was a cute little restaurant, too. The ambiance was nice. We ended up having, instead of getting entrees, we ended up deciding to go with three appetizers so we could just kind of sample them and share them. The first thing we had was a Mayan dip called... I, I can't pronounce that. It was know. a Mayan dip with house-made tortillas. So they made the tortillas fresh in the house and it was actually really, really good little dip. It was kind of thick and hearty and it was it was really savory. Yeah, I don't some... really know how to explain it, but it was it was, it was yum. Yeah, I can't I can't really explain <laughs> it, but it was, it was delicious. And then we also had crispy shrimp wontons, so some little fried wontons. It came with six wontons and it also also came with a side salad that we weren't um, expecting but it was a really really good salad it had some fresh um, orange and grapefruit on top beets and uh, it was delicious and cheese and cheese and cheese don't and forget you, the cheese can't forget the cheese and then we had a little tapas trio platter that had an empanada a lemon risotto ball that was deep fried mm -hmm. also had cheese yeah. as well they're called Aaron Sini's I guess I think I'm saying that Aaron Sini um, and then the other one was like a little tostada the third thing that was on the little tops plate was a little tostada with shrimp what we got shrimp but you had a choice of meat I think you could get chicken pork or shrimp we went with shrimp and just a little tostada with some fresh toppings on top of that highly highly recommend this place I would go back tonight for dinner I, so would I <laughs> it's really really, <laughs> it's good. It's a really, really good really really tasteful place and it's right on the main street here through Fort, Fort brag on highway one on the main street so really easy to find okay we're leaving the van because ice cream and not <laughs> just any ice cream this ice cream shop has an unusual flavor that i absolutely have to try so we're booking it over a place called calyx okay so calyx has homemade ice cream which i mean is cool yeah it's all locally made and they use local ingredients from like a local farm i believe like the milks and stuff so and they have different flavors like cheesecake and vanilla and strawberry and they also have mushroom so that's what we have it's mushroom yes. ice cream and it is amazing it almost tastes like they said inside it kind of tastes like pancakes and syrup and i think these little specks here are actual mushrooms are they yeah they're made from what's called a candy cat mushroom candy cat mushroom or the lactarius Rubidus. Dropping some, yeah. some science on you. Bacterius rubidus. Our next stop is the Pudding Creek Trestle, which is right behind me. This trestle was built back in 1915 as part of the 10 Mile Railroad. So the 10 Mile Railroad was built to bring lumber here into the town of Fort Bragg from, you guessed it, 10 miles north down into town. But perhaps one of my favorite features of this trestle, we've driven from the lower parking lot to the upper parking lot, and you get these beautiful views of the beach below. Really absolutely stunning. Our Pacific Coast Highway adventure has come to an end, but no worries, there are plenty more adventures coming up. So don't forget to subscribe, like this video, hit that notification bell, and until next time, stay wonderful. Call it a day.